Hi everyone, thank you for having me here today. So yeah, so I am a freelance conservator and I work all over, essentially where people, where anywhere where people will have me, really. I'm an object-based conservator generally, so I don't work on textiles, fine art, or, um, or paper. So what I'm gonna present here today is just sort of things that we've been doing to sort of engage with audiences. I'm gonna show some um, larger examples of larger projects that I've been working on, and just kind of thinking of Des ideas of how we can get conservation more into the narrative, really. Um, whoop, has that moved? Oh, it has. It doesn't move on my screen. That's confusing. Um, so generally, what we think about conservation is it is sort of, you know, behind the scenes. It's quite hidden, but it is a really great mix of art and craft and science. So its potential for outreach, I think, is really huge. Um, I spend a lot of my time, on, let me see if this works. So on social media. So I think the thing about social media is it is really great. And the audiences that I sort of capture are both local and actually more, I get more international followers. Um, but it is quite niche for me. So people often associate what I do with archaeology. So I get a lot of archaeology followers. But I'm sort of yet to kind of figure out how I engage with people with things that are not archaeology. Because the obviously the before and after photos are my classic standby. If I don't know how to I don't know what to put out there. I'll do it before and after. But there are a lot of people doing great things out there. The, the British Museum have a dedicated Instagram page and they really focus on the conservatives themselves more than the objects. They sort of are like a snapshot of what it's like to be a conservator and what they're doing at the British Museum. I create a lot of videos that one just sort of played through and they're really popular, especially videos would have a little bit of sound to them. I think the next one um, is another example. And sometimes I do these, these hybrid events with social media. So this is uh, the SS Great Britain project. So what my aim was to clean that bird. <laughs> um, and he's, well, he's, he's quite, yeah. It, it looks like a really sad chicken, as one of the children told me that looks like. And it was, so my job was to, it was in the gallery event as well as online. So as I went along, creating things that people could see online, as well as being on site in front of the public. I think this is, in terms of engaging with people, this is one of the harder projects to engage people with, I found, just because people are like, what are you do why are you doing that? It's just an old, dusty bird um, but he's actually he's actually called the last passenger so when the ship was recovered from the Falklands he was the last he was the last passenger that came back to the UK before it was put into Bristol so once people understood that story and then why I was doing the conservation um, it was it was much easier but people were also quite hesitant I find or at these sort of events to come for and to talk to you at all they always feel like they are interrupting you somehow in your space. And it's quite, sometimes it is quite hard to break that barrier. And obviously the thing that is the easiest thing for um, non, so for, for online is that paintings are kind of, the paintings that you see the most online in terms of social media, because they just look really great before and after, you know, these sort of big impact. Um, projects would have a, a definite result are much easier to promote through social media than it is than some lots of the objects I, I conserve look exactly the same beforehand that they do after so it is quite tricky sometimes so one of the I'm going to talk about two main projects this is the first one um, and I think the thing about conservation that I love is that it's all about telling stories how can we draw out stories from these objects and, and the people, so this is a community-led project. So there's a small friends group, this is in Shropshire, right on the Welsh border. And they have these amazing woven panels. And, you know, for, for me, it's all about how things were made, how things were used, how things were changed, and how we kind of tell that story. So these, these panels were quite amazing. Um, and they were just hanging off the wall. They went in sometime in the Victorian times. Um, the chapel is especially built by a London art artist called Birch, and he was actually the curator of the John Soames Museum for a short time. He actually died in post at the museum, 
whew, which is quite, quite the end. But, you know, to tell that sort of conservation story, it would have been quite easy because what we did, we sort of cleaned them, we stabilised them, and we put them back on the wall. But the thing about this project is people always said to us, these are rush or they're reed. And, you know, it was always taken that they were, you know, they look quite, um, they look imported. They weren't things that were made in this country. So we decided to have a look at that. And what we actually discovered is actually they're made from marram grass. And marram grass is a really tall grass. It's a really traditional grass that was used in the UK um, for a couple of hundred years, but it no longer exists and the tradition is completely dead. So the story sort of take, took on a different kind of route. So having this identified, what we can sort of say now is actually this isn't, this isn't, you know, probably imported. These, these are locally made, well, across the border in Wales. Um, so very locally made tradition of a sort of a lost craft and a lost art. So our next stage is to kind of take that piece of work and move forward and to really try and pr try and prove it because actually there are no there are no examples of anything like this that we can find currently there are descriptions and texts of what the um, the weavers were making but nothing is an example so it's quite you know that sort of story about how you know something sort of came together possibly internationally but actually it's probably quite local and um, and more stories we can tell from that going forward hopefully and that's is just kind of them before and after. But yeah, so the design, you could kind of, you could place that in a number of regions around this world, um, and that's them afterwards. But they're very beautiful things, they're very tactile, and they're in an environment which is not controlled. So, you know, the conservation story is really about them remaining in situ, you know, having people use them. I'm also going to talk just a couple of archaeological examples of how we try and draw out stories just a little bit more. So for Teviot, you may or may not know, I think that it's in Perth Museum now. So when that was excavated, it was only, the star object was the dagger and its gold hilt. But when you sort of, sort of draw down on it, at the, at the top of those, this sort of bundle at the top here, were all these little, let me see, oh, I can't do it, all these little flowers that you'll see on the right-hand side. So for me, the story about the conservation isn't, you know, the fact that we had a dagger and it was amazing. The story to me is that at the end of this process, people were putting flowers and there were tens of thousands of these in the grave at that end point. So, you know, giving it a slightly more human touch to that story. And also similarly, this is something I did recently from Baggington and it, this is a um, a merely medieval bowl for sort of ninth century, up found near the head um, area, even though there was no human remains left behind. But in the conservation work, you can see we found these tiny little details of some textile and some feathers. Um, we think duck or goose currently. Um, and again, it's like we could just leave it like that and say, you know, we found some textiles, we found some feathers. But actually what we're thinking now is that because it was near the head area, preserved by this copper alloy bowl, what we're looking at is a pillow. So this person was probably placed on a pillow in their burial. Great. And this is the biggest, the biggest project that I'm going to talk about. So I was involved in the Staffordshire Horde project and it is a it's a, found in the Midlands. It is the biggest ever early medieval hoard of gold and silver ever found. Um, it is a collection of torn apart gold objects that have been ripped apart from weapons, primarily swords, and some Christian objects. And this project had a really massive and sort of wide range of engagement activities that I'll have a look at. Um, and that's simply because there was so much interest in this project from you know, when it was first discovered, people would line up around the museum. Some of them lined up for four hours waiting to see it, and it was just a small cabinet at that point. And today, people will tell you, tell you like a badge of honour how long they stood in those lines to see that find. Um, so there was huge amount of engagement. You know, all the good and the great came. The now king and queen came. The pope came. <laughs> Vader came. Um, everyone was there. So it really had this massive appeal to people 
And I think the, the gold obviously drew people, but it was down to the sort of the team to sort of then make it more than that. So I think because the, the hoard is more than just gold. And so there was really two parts to this process. There was a very technical conservation research side where we collaborated with archaeologists and historians and scientists and anyone who would who really wants to touch gold and the conservation team uh, and the sort of um, conservation team led on the outreach side of things and it was really sustained over four years it's sort of like that's how long it took to conserve the finds um, and it actually it was never fitted into it was never budgeted for that side of things so all the the sort of the academic side or budget, but the, the conservation team were left with this kind of outreach possibilities because they were based at a museum it was felt that they couldn't lock it away and like just clean things and then show people it was felt that that sort of interactive engagement was really important given how much people you know lined up to come and see it they clearly wanted to see more so there were a lot of talks and a lot of behind the scene tours and the tours were great, you know, it allowed uh, them up to 20 people at a time to come down to the lab, they could look at the objects, because it's quite hard to see the detail on these very small objects um, just in an exhibition space. It also meant that they could engage with us and we could share what was happening as part of that research project. Um, it meant that stakeholders would come. And also the thing about the tours, which is really good, is that people paid to come and do them. So everyone paid 20 pounds. Um, to come down to the lab for an hour to see these things. Um, and it was really popular. It was always booked up, I think, solidly for three years, once a month, people came. Um, and the talks were done in very casual styles. So we did talks in the, the small you know, temporary gallery, gallery space, but also lecture styles. We would go out and talk to anyone who would listen to us, basically. Um, and then... We did some, you know, usually the blogs, and we did some really great social media where we did interactive Q&A. So we would sit in the computer and the social media person would yell a question across the lab to us from someone, and we would say something quite dry back and they would make it funny. So it's usually what happened. Um, but special events, so these um, girls at the bottom here, you know, they are, they are sort of, becoming conservators for the day. Um, they get some, a block of soil. It contains some objects that we've found either down at the charity store at Poundland, other places are available, obviously. Um, and, you know, they got to be that because they put the lab coats on, you know, they had some solvents, it's just water, and they got to be a conservator. So that was, you know, really great in terms of engagement. We even cleaned some of the finds in the in the museum. Um, it obviously took some special security, but again, people were really, really more of an adult audience would come to those. The children weren't very interested, but you know, these adult, adults would come and ask questions and you know, it was really great. Again, the problem with that was getting people through the door because we had to do it in a confined security space, getting people to come in and talk to us um, and not think they're interrupting, again, is always a big challenge, I think. So we had, we had greeters in this time, so we sort of invited people to come in and talk to us, and, you know, people sort of dropped questions in, or we would just start chatting to them. Um, and the only sort of side from this, is obviously there was no budget attached to it, it was just our time, which was, you know, sometimes significant, but it all sort of had, was all balanced in with the major research project. And, you know, I would make any opportunity of a bit of engagement. Um, this ended up in The Guardian. I was quite proud of it. I was, you know, just kind of like, yeah, anything we could find that anyone might be interested in, we would try and get it out as a story. Um, and the final thing that we did, actually, is the conservation really led, because the collection's so fragmented, we would often say to people, but there's a helmet in here, and they'd go, yeah, yeah. Sure, I totally believe you. But as a, you know, and they just sort of, it's really hard to envision, you know, envision what a helmet would look like, especially when we only have few examples, um, Sutton Who being the most famous. So we decided to make one, the, well, the museums decided to make one. So we did, so we had a collaborative process where it is the, we had the 
craftspeople. So this is Sam, she's a jeweler. So she, was, she had to attach all these little pieces to the helmet. Um, I actually made that fantastic looking crest that you either love or you hate. Um, and lots of the conservation process went into the little bit so that some of the holes in the crest and the side, we started to make sense of those things that are identified through conservation like beeswax, um, you know, we could start putting those back in and actually create this helmet on the evidence. And um, it is, you know, it is a magnificent looking beast, that helmet. Um, but in classic style, we made Mark take it off with, with gloves. He wasn't actually allowed to touch it. <laughs> That's that conservator, you know, that conservator spin on it. Um, and this is uh, it's obviously what made you know headline news because it's a it's, it's a beautiful thing. This was my quote in the Guardian, an academically respectable guesstimate. I'm not sure I didn't say that, but if I did, at least I said it was academically respectable. Um, so, and I think the key takeaways there was at some point, no matter what um, who the audience was, we did try and find something for everyone. And if all else fails, as we know at museums. You just make cake. So we ran, you know, social media cake competitions. Um, and this young boy was the winner of the children's category. I particularly love how he's matched his icing and his, and his shirt, the stripes. But, you know, some people weren't really interested in the hoard, but they do love cake. So we had quite, you know, we had almost 200 entries of people sending us photos of cakes. Next time I felt we should have in-person cake tasting, but it wasn't that practical. But you know, the methods that we used, they involved a little bit planning and there were, some were a little resource heavy, but most of the resource was in the time. But it is, you know, finding who you want your audience to be and how we can fit a conservation narrative within that was the, the, more, the more tricky part. Um, but actually the thing, the visitors were genuinely thrilled to come to the lab. And I think that was the outstanding activity we did of all of it that kind of in-person, special, behind the scenes, privileged view that you know I get all the time and sometimes forget. That was the thing that they really valued, that they, we were showing them something that they wouldn't see otherwise. And you know, we, we carried that on. So again, these special events where you know, kids get to clean a bit of soil, put on the lab coat, are still really popular. Do them for you know, archeology span week and other sort of events as well. And also involve conservation in other children's events. So, you know, um, we talk about mummification, how decay and how objects change. So, we, you know, we can get children to create a, an apple. This is one I made, quite proud of it. Um, you know, and on the, on the other side, that is a feathered sheep. But we also discuss how as, um, as an archaeologist, if you found that object in a thousand years, what would you be left behind and why is that? So in a sort of a technical way, we, we help sort of explain why we're left with what we've left and what, what could be missing. So if you found that object was just a, you know, some legs and arms with, with holes in it, how would you explain that? So again, sort of trying to put a process into, into language that small children could understand. Um, so really what's my point? Um, so I think the key thing about conservation stories and getting it out there, engaging wider, it's all about collaboration. I think the story of conservation alone isn't enough really to engage lots of different groups. It is telling that narrative about why it's important, what we've learned from it, and kind of what it means to people. Um, but we, there's always a story to tell, I think. There's always something that can add a bit of richness to the narrative. So I'll just leave you with my quite often favourite quote that, you know, that's often what people tell me. It looks much better than I thought it would. Um, great. And that was everything. Thank you.